Hello and welcome to History 342. Today we're going to talk about the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. To paraphrase Eddie Izzard, what on earth is that? In short, it's effectively an attempt to craft or to present the Empire of Japan as a collaborative enterprise between Japan and other Asian peoples. Or really, at the very least, to portray the Empire of Japan as something that was altruistic, that was seeking to improve the lot of Asia under, of course, Japanese leadership. It's not announced until 1940, but it kind of exists as an idea in some form or shape, uh, certainly going back to 1937, which as we already know is the beginning of World War II in East Asia with the invasion of the Chinese mainland by Japanese land troops. There are two main aspects to this I want to talk about today. First of all, basically the way in which this co-prosperity sphere reflects Japan's reality as being on a war footing now and Japan's status as a wartime nation and secondly the extent to which Japan is kind of trying to take some sense of ideological ownership here of a pan-Asian identity of a pan-Asian kind of concept and you know and why they would do that. So a quick note on Japanese expansionism in the late 1930s and 1940s in short, it was very successful. Uh, in 1931, they kind of, you know, foray into Manchuria, and as of 1932, effectively have claimed that as their own territory. Well, technically not. It's a puppet state, but everyone knows that it more or less belongs to Japan. Korea has been a Japanese colony since 1910. Taiwan has been a Japanese colony since 1895. As of 1940, with the fall of the French in Europe, Germany, Nazi Germany, an ally of the Japanese, more of that in a few minutes, effectively hands over Vietnam to the Japanese. And then as 1941 goes on, Japan effectively steamrolls down through Southeast and uh, the rest of East Asia, taking places like American Colony, the Philippines, as well as other territory further to the South. So by the end of 1941, going into 1942, Japan controls a large swathe of territory across East Asia and Southeast Asia, going down almost as far as Australia. So what does this mean? In short, it means that Japan has access to resources it badly needs, including, not least of which, oil. Um, Japan itself, geographically, is not the most uh, resource-laden uh, place in terms of natural resources, at least not the natural resources that were required for the industrialization they had been pushing at a very hard pace for decades at this point. Secondly, the Japanese have effectively realized the goal that at least some Japanese had as early as the 1870s and 1880s of creating a kind of a British style modern empire. But in Asia, the Japanese now appear to have done that. And, um, you know, what will they do? There's an extent to which they've been working on this already in Taiwan and in Korea. And there have been lots of discussions back and forth in Tokyo and in colonial governments in Seoul and in Taipei about how to kind of, you know, what this means and what it means for Japanese people who live in the colonies and what it means for people who were born in those colonies. Are they Japanese imperial subjects? What's going to happen there? Um, as we talked about before in class, before the break, you know, the experience in Korea and Taiwan were quite different experiences. And as I talked about the other day, those experiences also ramped up pretty significantly going into the 1930s as more was expected of those colonial populations. So the empire provides very clear kind of material benefits to the Japanese, not least of which in the harvesting of resources, but also creates a very interesting ideological question for the Japanese. The National General Mobilization Law of 1938, which had effectively put Japan on a full war footing under the leadership of Kanoe Fumamaro, um, and really through the leadership of the Japanese military through Prime Minister Kanoe, really, you know, reorganized the society in a fairly dramatic way. As you're seeing in the sources, censorship was a thing at this point in Japan, quite a major thing. There'd always been discussions over the previous couple of decades as to what responsible reporting was and all this kinds of thing. But certainly by the mid to late 1930s, there's just no question um, that you cannot uh, print things and you probably shouldn't talk about things that the military doesn't want you to talk about. So this is a, a huge shift in things. There's also a lot of talk in Japan, particularly circulated by various kind of figures in the military, as to what it means to be a Japanese subject, like what responsibilities um, are laden within that. I mentioned the assassination of Inukai Tsuyoshi last week, the Japanese Prime Minister killed in his own home. Um, he was killed by naval cadets who basically made the argument that what they had done was an act of loyalty to the emperor. And this was an increasingly uh, popular idea 
within various strains of the Japanese military. It was interpreted in different ways by different people, and you end up having the emergence of these different factions, the Imperial Way faction, the Control faction, all these kinds of different you know groups of people within Japanese military leadership. But there's this very highly ideological understanding um, of what it means to be you know a loyal Japanese person, to be an effective Japanese person, which you know when you add all these Japanese people together adds up to an effective Japanese state. Now some of these ideas are kind of typically characteristic of how we think about modernity and, and the individual and the state combining all these ideas, these utilitarian concepts, particularly the late 19th century. But of course, the 1930s, there is a different uh, context to that, um, which I mentioned in the last video. And if you were here with me, I would say, and what is that? It begins with F. And a bright, enterprising person would say, fascism? Yes, fascism. There's a real issue here of what's going on. Now, whether or not Japan is fascist, we're, we're slowly getting into that big, big, big question. There are certainly Japanese military people and Japanese people in charge of the political infrastructure who understand the individual roles and responsibilities of a Japanese person in highly ideological ways. So in effect, the kind of borderline between the material reality of Japan being on a war footing, you know, uh, factories being pushed towards wartime production, the dissolution of unions, all this kind of thing, and the ideological reality, what that means, and the ideological kind of experience of a Japanese empire, the lines between those things are, are blurring, and are blurring pretty significantly. It's also important to note that by this point, certainly by 1940, when the Tripartite Pact is signed, that Japan, Germany, and Italy are formal allies. They are, in fact, now the Axis parties, and Japan is an Axis power. And that's important. It's important because it plays into, for example, the occupation of Vietnam, which is effectively handed over to them by the Vichy government, i.e. Uh, by the Nazis. It's important to understand because, as we've mentioned briefly in class before, there are problems in uh, Japanese behavior in World War II, that war crimes are a very, very serious issue. Um, and that, you know, as the decades will go by, for example, a Chinese person today in 2020 might feel an awful lot more comfortable equating the Japanese in World War II to, for example, Nazi Germany than maybe Maybe an American would at the same time. Um, that's not to say that it's an easy uh, comparison. The Holocaust, correctly, in my view, is a major distinction that makes the Nazis their own thing in all kinds of different ways. But certainly there should be uh, an amount of discomfort um, that the Nazi flag was being um, aired at various kind of places and displayed um, in Japan, that the Japanese alliance with the Germans was very clear and very open and um, was a major part of their identity as a late 1930s, early 1940s power. This is interesting in lots of different ways. You know, like the, the Germans had been a big, had had a big role in East Asia for decades at this point. Both the Chinese and the Japanese had borrowed from the Germans very heavily uh, in terms of building their own parliamentary systems and building their military systems as well, and even and their educational systems also. And as a result, there were definitely German advisors traveling over to China and Japan for quite a long time at this point. Um, in Japan, the Japanese-German interaction is, is pretty high and pretty deep, if that makes sense, at the same time, at a high level um, and with deep penetration. There's lots of kind of German influence in Japanese intellectual ideas. And although for you and me today, 1933 is just a very clear inflection point, at which point a murdering monster takes control of Germany, um, it's an inflection point in the 1930s too, but something that's taking a while for people to process. I mean, I think the best example of this, of course, is Neville Chamberlain who to this day is renowned for, quote unquote, you know, appeasing the Nazis. And the core problem with appeasement, of course, was that uh, there was a lack of understanding of how horrific Hitler really was. Now, I think that it's fair to point out that Hitler wasn't hiding many things. The final solution wasn't a thing yet in the 1930s. But in Mein Kampf, Mein Kampf is a hateful, hateful book. And, and, and Hitler does not hide how he feels about Jewish people. And um, it's not hard to, at least in 2020, it's not hard to make these connections between um, what Hitler's writing in Mein Kampf and what happens then in the 1940s. Um, I would say, I wouldn't go as far as to say anyone's defense per se, but I would say that it would be hard to imagine it um, until it was done. That, that That's one of the true monstrosities of the Holocaust. Now, I, I, why am I talking about the Germans quite so much? Well, we're gonna come into a discussion over the next few you know videos, um, and it's showing up in your readings already, even though we're still talking about Japan during the war, the question of how we will look at Japan 
after the war is an absolutely huge, huge question. And it's a question that's still very relevant today. And there's certainly people in China and the Chinese government um, would have very strong feelings and would want to cast the Japanese in a very specific way. So, for example, the, the formal title of World War II um, in, Japan, in China, rather, is the Great Anti-Fascist War of Resistance. And there's this very, there's this, there's this um, keen desire to paint the Japanese as fascist. And not ja just that, but you, there, there are people in China who would argue that what the Japanese did in China is akin to a Holocaust. Now, that's extremely... Um, an extremely difficult topic to get into. I think the short version is that I would not agree, and I, I, I think that we have to be very, very careful about how we use that term Holocaust and not to devalue it. Um, there's a reason, there's a slippery slope towards what we call Holocaust denial, and I think that, you know, um, arguing or even implying that the numbers of people who died is less than, than it actually factually was is a hugely problematic issue, but also using that term and throwing it around is a very tricky one as well. At the same time, the Japanese caused much hurt, not just in China, but all across East and Southeast Asia. Now, at the same time, the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere was built on this concept of Pan-Asianism. What does that mean? You know, certainly for some Japanese intellectuals, the idea of Japan leading a Pan-Asian movement was very attractive. And it had been attractive for a long time. Going back to the very start of the first Japanese colony in, in Taiwan in 1895, there were discussions, at least once the kind of local population had been pacified, there were discussions about what this meant and what does it mean to be um, a Japanese imperial subject. And, and if you're born in Taiwan and if you're ethnically Chinese or even ethnically Aboriginal Taiwanese, as opposed to uh, ethnically Japanese, what does this mean for your status within you know, the empire of Japan more broadly? And there'd always been this back and forth, and I've mentioned this before in class, you know, of assimilation, i.e. The, the idea that everybody would become part of the empire, versus coexistence, which is that we're okay with their kind of being Japanese subjects and then they're being colonial subjects. They don't really care. Um, it's a much more pragmatic idea. We took Taiwan because we wanted um, a good strategic beachhead against the Chinese if we need it, and we can produce lots of sugar in Taiwan. Um, similarly in Korea, especially once the war really gets going, many, many Koreans are put to work in mines, um, both in Korea and in Japan, to produce resources for the Japanese war machine. And there's no real kind of second guessing of that or question that or anything else. But then going back, all this time, there had always been voices and ideas in Japan, in, in influential Japanese circles, arguing for um, the virtues of, of a genuine kind of Pan-Asian kind of concept. Now, what does this actually mean in practice? There's certainly an amount of cultural assimilation um, in the colonies, particularly in Korea, which is arguably... Um, the best example of this. It shows up most frequently in Japanese wartime propaganda where you'll kind of see, you know, a Japanese leader or a Japanese leading figure, it might be children, you know, leading other Asian figures, um, you know, in some kind of, you know, uh, communal effort. Um, and in other types of propaganda, the idea of the Japanese as the leaders of the quote-unquote yellow race, words that would be used at the time by the Japanese in English and, and kind of are fairly decent translations of how the language has been used at the time in Japanese versus the white races or the capitalist races and so on. And so there's kind of a lot of mixed messaging in some sense. And it seems like a, it certainly seems like a, a swift and dramatic turnaround from where the Japanese had been all throughout Meiji modernization. But then again, you know, Japanese and um, Western relations had suffered very badly um, in the 1930s. And with the uh, turn into militarism, the Japanese, you know, became anti-Western really um, because of strategic realities and what was seen and what actually was in practice um, a Western attempt to constrain the Japanese and prevent them from becoming any more powerful and interesting ideological concepts that in some cases are taking these kind of long-standing ideas of imperial loyalty and really transforming in them into something quite odd. I mean for example in the 1930s and 1940s, you see this concept of the Yamato Damashi, this idea of um, effectively that the blood of Japanese men is pure in this very specific way and has very kind of specific characteristics. Um, and a lot of this language is highly, highly ideological. At the same time, the extent to which the Greater East Asia Core Prosperity Sphere is ever a real thing beyond mostly half-hearted propaganda efforts is pretty questionable, frankly. Um, as I say, Korea, the Korean people are effectively strip-mined for Japanese needs. Um, men are thrown into mines and women are taken up to be comfort women and, and suffer other, you know, un unfortunate fates that we'll talk about.
in the future. And the commitment of the Japanese is to, to any kind of a real sense of co-prosperity, whatever that means, is, is pretty hollow. And what's the next step for Japan? Well, it's the war against the United States. As you probably know, on December the 7th, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in a sneak attack. It's kind of a sneak attack by accident. We'll talk about that more in a future video. Um, 3,700 Americans are reported dead in one day. It is this huge moment in American history. Um, it is, you know, until 9-11, there probably isn't another kind of moment where America feels attacked like this. There's all these casualties in one moment. And this concept of remember Pearl Harbor creates an ideological shift on the American side um, that really kind of ends up reflecting what the Japanese are doing. And so on both sides, you're gonna have this kind of mixture of the reality of war and the ideological representation of war. And as we've seen the, for the Japanese, that was this Pan-Asian idea of collaboration that, um, that was pretty thin when it came down to it. Um, and we'll talk more about that as we go. So discussion question for today. What is the logic behind the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, the ideological logic, uh, the, uh, the attempt to promote it, what, what's in it for the Japanese, and how does that fit into a specific historical narrative the Japanese are perhaps trying to tell? Thanks very much. See you next time.